Welcome. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the forgotten history of Tulare Lake. In the 1800s, it was the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi River. By 1900, most of the land was drained and converted to rich farmland. 2023 will be the fourth time in the last 100 years that the lake has refilled from melting snow. In the 1800s, Tulare Lake was surrounded by swampland and fed by four major rivers. The Kern River, the Thule River, the Cahuilla River, and the Kings River. When it would reach maximum size, the Tulare Lake would spill over its north rim into the San Joaquin River and drain to the San Francisco Bay. During dry years, the size of the lake and the marshes would contract. Tulare Lake got its name from the tule reeds that surrounded the edge of the lake. Tules are a giant species of sedge native to freshwater marshes all over North America. Archaeologists have recovered large spear points and other artifacts around the Tulare Lake bed. The artifacts show that Native Americans were thriving in the San Joaquin Valley 10,000 years ago when the last ice age ended. Various Yokuts tribes surrounded the area around Tulare Lake. Not surprisingly, tule reeds were an abundant building supply that were often used to build shelter and boats. Due to the fluctuating lake levels between wet years and drought years, the Yokuts tribes never really created any permanent settlements on the shores of Tulare Lake. When the lake was too dry or too wet, the Yokuts tribes could relocate to better hunting grounds in the foothill areas. Descendants of the Tulare Lake Yokuts people are found in several tribes in the area today. Two examples are the Tachi Yokut tribe and the Thule River tribe. Both of these tribes are leveraging Indian gaming to support economic development. For the most part, Spanish missionaries stayed away from the San Joaquin Valley and focused on their missions along the El Camino Real in the coastal area. Beginning in 1769, there was some Spanish colonial traffic along the west side of the San Joaquin Valley along El Camino Viejo. One report from 1824 indicates that Tulare Lake was dry at the time. From the mid-1800s through the late 1800s, all maps of the San Joaquin Valley show the Tulare Lake as a very large body of water. 1852 to 1878 was an especially wet period in California's history. The 200-year flood that hit California in 1862 was so bad that newly elected Governor Leland Stanford had to take a rowboat from his mansion in Sacramento to the state capitol. Immediately thereafter, he temporarily moved the state capitol from Sacramento to San Francisco. In 1874, a steamboat was launched on Tulare Lake to provide service between four locations. Service was provided between places called Terrapin Bay, Two Adobes, Artesia, and Atwell's Island. Modern nearby place names are Stratford, Kettleman City, Corcoran, and Alpaw. Tulare Lake was loaded with fish. There are many reports of lake trout reaching 50 pounds and 3 to 4 feet in length. These were likely steelhead, which would occasionally become landlocked during intervening dry years. The historic range of the steelhead trout is shown in red on the map. This map shows the historic range of the thick-tailed chub. The thick-tailed chub was once the most common fish in California. Archaeological sites around the old Tulare Lake show that this fish was an important component of the diet of the Yokuts tribes. This species became extinct in 1957 due to the introduction of non-native predator fish and the draining of its habitat. Freshwater mussels and clams were another important food source used by the Yokuts. One of the pioneer gold miners in the mountains above Bakersfield reported clam bakes that were held by the Yokut tribes. The large clam bakes were multi-day events every year and served to promote trade when tribes gathered from coastal regions and the east side of the Sierras. 
Another aquatic species that flourished in Tulare Lake was the western pond turtle. At the time, they were referred to as terrapin. Terrapin was a big delicacy on the restaurant menus in San Francisco. The water witch was brought in to fish for terrapin in Tulare Lake. One year, it shipped 3,000 dozen terrapin to San Francisco. The U.S. government enacted the Swamplands Act in 1850. California received over 2 million acres of swamp and overflowed lands, which was loosely defined as lands that required drainage or levees in order to be cultivated. At the time, wetlands were not viewed as an ecosystem to be preserved. Instead, the wetlands were viewed as a problem to be converted to farmland. Ditches and levees were built in all directions around Tulare Lake. Eventually, the lake was dried out and the area shaded blue was full of irrigated farms. Farmers were drawn from all over the United States seeking a new life with low-cost land. A notable milestone in California's history occurred at the north end of Tulare Lake during this period. It is known as the Muscle Slough Tragedy. It was a land title conflict between farmers and the railroad. The conflict boiled over into gunfire and seven men lost their lives. The Octopus, published by Frank Norris in 1901, is a historical novel about the Muscle Slough tragedy. The title was likely based on political cartoons at the time, which described the monopoly power of the railroad as an octopus. At the end of the 1800s, and during the very early 1900s, lake level records show Tulare Lake rapidly expanding and contracting. The lake would get bigger during wet years and then decrease in size during dry years. By 1920, the lake was completely drained and many thought it would be permanently be dry farmland. This map includes a north-south elevation line showing the spill point topography for Tulare Lake near Riverdale. This graph shows the Tulare Lake surface elevation over time. It shows that the dry Tulare Lake bottom was flooded during very wet years in 1938, 1969, and 1983. Flow rate data collected by the USGS on the Thule River near Porterville can also be correlated to the Tulare Lake water level. Extremely high flow rates during the floods of 1969 and 1983 are correlated directly to high water levels on Tulare Lake and also some infamous boat trips. Tulare Lake filled up during the flood of 1938. A Shafter High School teacher and local historian with three others took a boat from Bakersfield to Treasure Island in the San Francisco Bay. During the flood of 1969, two Kern County ranchers and their sons took two boats from Bakersfield to the San Francisco Bay. During the 1969 flood, some of the levees broke naturally and some were intentionally broken to direct floodwaters. Some levees were lined with junk cars to strengthen them. Eventually, the lake covered a very large area. The flooding of 1983 resulted in a similar footprint for Tulare Lake. A clay layer below Tulare Lake slows the extent of the seepage into the ground. As a result, it can take a couple of years for Tulare Lake to dry out after flood years. During the flood year of 1983, two Bakersfield men kayaked from Beach Park in Bakersfield to the Richmond Marina on the San Francisco Bay. As 2023 shapes up to be a huge flood year in California, Tulare Lake levels may surpass those seen in 1983. Earlier in 2023, the Thule River near Porterville has already reached flood stage. The Thule River is one of four major rivers feeding into Tulare Lake. Following is some video recorded at various points along the Thule River on March 28, 2023. Melting of record snowpack in the Sierra Mountains will keep the Thule River full for the next couple of months and the Tulare Lake level will continue to rise. The Success Dam was built on the Thule River in 1961 for the purposes of flood control and water storage. On March 28, 2023, Lake Success was nearly full and up to the spillway. At this point in time, the lake could not really serve as a flood control reservoir. 
At this point in time, nearly all water flowing into the reservoir had to be let out. Above the east end of the lake, the Sierra snowpack can be seen that will continue feeding the reservoir for months to come. Depending on how the spring runoff hits, this spillway may see a lot of service in the coming weeks. This is a look at the river below the dam and to the east of Porterville. Lots of debris lines the bank of the river and lots of trees have their trunks covered from the high water level from the river. The view upstream from the same bridge shows the river outside of its normal banks and impacting trees along the river banks. The snow-capped Sierras can be seen in the background from this view from a bridge to the west of Porterville. The river is only a couple of feet below its banks and looking downstream from the bridge you can see that tree trunks are covered by the river waters. Another view of the flooded trees along the edge of the Thule River. Further downstream, a county maintenance crew was encountered that was removing flood debris from under and around a bridge. The water level of the river is at the same level as the roadway of the bridge and it can clearly be seen that the river is at flood stage at this location. It's important for the county crews to keep the debris away from these bridges, to keep the bridges from being undermined, and to keep the levees along the side of the river from being washed out and further flooding occurring. At this location along the river, on the south side of the river, it could be seen that the levee had been breached and floodwaters were slowly moving into the orchard next to the river. Scenes like this are likely being repeated in many areas around Tulare Lake. Further west, it could be seen where floodwaters crossing fields were actually cutting through a levee and back into a canal and then heading south on toward the Tulare Lake Basin. And a little bit further to the west, the effective end of the Thule River was reached and you could see the edge of the Tulare Lake forming from the high flows from the river.